Coming up in our newscast tonight. As we inch closer to another historic summit, President Moon Jae-in visits Washington again. Included in his itinerary are meetings with top officials and a sit-down with his American counterpart, with North Korea being the central topic. Seoul's reporters head to Beijing to try to get to North Korea to witness a key step in the regime's efforts to denuclearize. Yet, Pyongyang has still not confirmed their invitation to the event. At long last, lawmakers passed two contested bills, the extra budget and an investigation into an online opinion rigging scandal. News Center begins now. It's 8 p.m. here in Korea, live from our studio in Seoul. This is Arirang News Center. Welcome to our program. I'm Daniel Che. Our top story at this hour is President Moon Jae-in's trip to the United States. The plan face-to-face -face with his American counterpart comes amid a recent shift in tone by Pyongyang. Cha sang -mi starts us off with the liberal leader's itinerary in Washington. South Korean President Moon Jae-in on Monday afternoon left the presidential Blue House to head to Washington for his sit-down with President Donald Trump. North Korea is expected to dominate their discussions with Trump scheduled to meet North Korean leader Kim Jong-un on June 12th in Singapore. President Moon will arrive in Washington Monday evening local time and will spend the night at the Blair House, an official VIP guest house at the White House. The next morning, he's scheduled to meet top U.S. officials in charge of foreign and security policies. As for the most anticipated part of his trip, a sit-down with Trump, the Blue House confirmed that the meeting will be private, with no attendees present other than the interpreters. After the one-on-one, -on -one, Moon and Trump will move to an expanded meeting over a business lunch. After his meeting with Trump, President Moon will visit the Korean legation in Washington to commemorate the 130th anniversary of its opening and the 136th anniversary of the 1882 signing of the United States-Korea Treaty of Peace. Moon will touch down back in Korea early Thursday Korean time. And the summit comes as North Korea abruptly canceled high-level talks with South Korea last week, even threatening to scrap its planned summit with Trump, saying it won't be unilaterally pressured into giving up its nuclear weapons. This is President Moon's third visit to the United States since he came to office, and the fifth meeting between the two leaders. Cha sang -mi, Arirang News. And this is the week North Korea promised to invite foreign reporters to come and witness the end of Pyongyang's nuclear test site in Punggyeri. But according to our EG1, uncertainty rooms for South Korean journalists with the regime still not responding to their visa application. A total of eight South Korean reporters left for Beijing on Monday to cover North Korea's dismantling of its nuclear test site. But Pyongyang has still not accepted their visa application, which Seoul's Unification Ministry sent again on Monday morning. Despite the ministry's efforts to confirm the South Korean reporter's invitation throughout the day, Pyongyang's Panmunjom channel closed in the afternoon, saying there is nothing more to exchange as of now. In an effort to get an answer, South Korean reporters who traveled to Beijing gathered in front of the North Korean embassy in Beijing, but to no avail. But the ministry is still hopeful that there could be a change in stance from Pyongyang on Tuesday morning, just before the scheduled flight to the North Wonsan Kalma airport. Pyongyang's silence comes after the regime criticized Seoul last week for holding joint military drills with the U.S. and for allowing a former North Korean diplomat who defected to the South to criticize the regime at Seoul's National Assembly. Also in front of the embassy in Beijing were a handful of Japanese reporters who hadn't been invited by Pyongyang in the first place. The North had invited reporters from South Korea, China, the U.S., Russia and the U.K., explicitly leaving Japan out. Observers say that is due to Japan's continuous hardline stance against the North and Tokyo's pressing of the U.S. on agendas for the upcoming Pyongyang-Washington summit. Meanwhile, the North seems to be preparing to dismantle the nuclear test site. U.S.-based North Korea monitoring website 38 North reported that satellite images show that several key operational support buildings at the nuclear test site have been taken down, and some of the rails for the mining carts that go in and out of the tunnels have also been removed. 
What's also notable is that four rows of small structures placed on the hillside some 200 meters south of the site's west portal have become much more visible. While their purpose remains unclear, it's thought they could have been built for the reporters to safely watch the test site being demolished. Reporters from other countries have all received their visas and are expected to take off from Beijing on a chartered plane Tuesday morning to arrive in the north-southeastern city of Wonsan. From there, they will take a train to the test site for the demolition, which could take place any day between Wednesday and Friday. Lee Ji-won, Arirang News. However, Seoul remains optimistic that Pyongyang will allow the South Korean media to cover the dismantling of the test site, as the topic was discussed at the Inter-Korean Summit. The nation's unification minister told Yonhap News today that the process is a meaningful first step toward complete denuclearization. Cho Myung-yoon stressed Seoul's journalists should be able to cover the event to earn international support on improving inter-Korean relations and denuclearizing the peninsula. Regarding the possibility of the nation's reporters being excluded from the coverage, the minister replied, we'll have to wait and see. Still, until Monday afternoon when the two sides closed their daily contact channel, Pyongyang had not accepted the list of South Korean reporters for the event. Two highly contested bills are passed at the National Assembly, the extra budget and another that calls for a special probe into an online opinion-rigging scandal. Rival parties have been locking horns over the specifics for too long, so it's about time. Kim Min-ji brings us the positive developments from Parliament. The National Assembly on Monday gave the green light to the government's extra budget proposal, as well as a bill that calls for a special probe into an online opinion-rigging scandal. Rival parties had agreed to vote on both issues simultaneously, the ruling party okaying the special probe bill in exchange for the opposition passing the extra budget proposal as part of a deal to end a 42-day standstill of parliament. The revised extra budget bill, which will mainly be used to breathe life into the ailing job market, is roughly 20 million U.S. dollars less than the initial government proposal of $3.6 billion after some areas were cut and others expanded. The passage comes 45 days after the government submitted its proposal and is the second supplementary budget under the Moon Jae-in administration. As for the special probe, the investigation will last for 60 days with a possible one-time extension of 30 days. The Korean Bar Association will recommend four special prosecutor candidates, of which the opposition bloc will select two, while the final pick will be made by the president. Also on the team will be three assistant independent counsels, 13 prosecutors and 35 inspectors. The scandal revolves around a blogger known better as Drew King, who used a computer program to manipulate internet comments on political news articles, with mounting speculation that he may have been engaged in rigging activities in the run-up to last year's presidential election. What's been another issue is that Drew King is also known to have ties with Kim kyung soo a former ruling party lawmaker and a close friend of President Moon Jae-in. And there are new reports that he met with another close aide of the president. It will be the first independent council probe under the current government, and the investigation will likely start after the local elections scheduled for June 13th. Although getting these two bills off their plate is expected to somewhat calm the dispute between rival parties, there is concern of another dispute brewing, as a legal deadline to vote on the government's proposal to amend the constitution, which is sitting at parliament, is this Thursday. The ruling party says a vote needs to happen even though a referendum can't be held alongside the local elections, but opposition parties say they will demand that the president withdraw his proposal as it will likely be voted down. Kim min Staying in the domestic political arena, let's delve deeper into the government's extra budget bill set aside to help create new jobs for young people and boost regional economies. While deemed necessary by many, there have been strong voices of opposition. Our Wan jung -hwan outlines how the supplementary funds could efficiently serve its purpose. The 3.52 billion U.S. dollar extra budget bill the second of its kind under the Moon Jae-in administration, was approved by the National Assembly on Monday. Compared to the initial government proposal, $366 million worth of extra funds were newly earmarked, while $344 million worth were cut. 
for an overall reduction of $20 million, according to the latest revision. By sector, while the budget for social overhead capital and research and development has been expanded, extra funds for education and general administration have been reduced. Support measures to cover transportation expenses for young adults working at small to medium-sized companies were reduced, but projects for supporting customized farmlands were expanded. A large chunk of the money approved by lawmakers will be used to subsidize the hiring of new regular workers at smaller firms. Also, the funds will be spent to help those who lost their jobs in the wake of massive restructuring in the country's shipbuilding and automobile sectors. The extra budget is a part of the Moon administration's key policy goals to create quality new jobs in the country and tackle the high youth unemployment rate, which still stands above 10 percent as of April. Youth unemployment has consistently worsened mainly due to changes in the country's industrial, education and labor structures. Since jobs are linked to many other social issues such as the birth rate and welfare policies, the government has identified job creation as the most urgent national issue. As the bill has passed now, the related ministries will hold a meeting to approve a budget implementation plan that will eventually help simplify administrative procedures to promptly inject funds into various programs. Won Zhongwan, Arirang News. The nation's producer prices inched up slightly in April, fueled mainly by rising oil prices. 18 months of consecutive gains are recorded. According to data released by the Bank of Korea, the leading indicator of consumer inflation stood at 104.13, climbing half a percent from the month prior. The BOK attributed the increase to the global upward trend of crude prices. The brewing trade war with China is on hold. That's from the U.S. Treasury Secretary as the two superpowers set up a framework to address related imbalances in the future. Kim hye gets us up to speed with the developments. After months of tensions, the United States and China have agreed to take measures to substantially reduce America's massive trade deficit with China. The two countries also agreed on meaningful increases of U.S. agriculture and energy exports and greater efforts to increase trade while striving to create a level playing field for competition. The joint statement released Saturday comes after two days of talks in Washington led by U.S. Treasury Secretary Steven Mnuchin and Beijing Special Envoy and State Council Vice Premier Liu He. Mnuchin said in an interview with Fox News on Sunday that the two sides are putting the trade war and tariffs on hold while they try to execute the framework, echoing remarks by Beijing's Vice Premier Liu He. This round of talks have been pragmatic, fruitful and efficient. We reached many agreements. These meetings will not just help bilateral economic and trade relations and build overall ties. It's good for people in both countries. U.S. President Donald Trump had threatened to impose tariffs of up to 150 billion U.S. dollars on Chinese imports with China, vowing to retaliate with tariffs of 25 percent on over 100 U.S. goods from soybeans to airplanes. A possible trade war had kept markets on edge in recent weeks. The temporary trade war ceasefire soothes market concerns, removing a downside risk to global trade and also to Korea as a U.S.-China trade war would hurt Korea's exports like intermediary goods to China. But then again, the deal is still short on specifics. The deal lacks a dollar figure on the trade deficit. Just before the second trade talks, both countries were sharply at odds over a claim made by White House economic advisor Larry Kudlow, who said China would slash its trade deficit with the U.S. by $200 billion by 2020. U.S. intellectual property, Beijing's structural reform and China's demand of U.S. investment all remain sticking points between the two countries. The U.S. will send a team led by Commerce Secretary Wilbur Ross to China to hammer out the details. So while a trade war has been averted, there still may be more friction along the way. Kim hye Arirang News. Questions grow over the fate of the nuclear deal struck with Iran during the previous U.S. administration as President Trump pulls Washington out of it. Tehran's top diplomat urged the EU to do more in its push to salvage that pact. Noaram shares with us his remarks. The main concern for Iran is how its economy will be affected by America's withdrawal from the 2015 nuclear deal. 
Washington has said it would reimpose sanctions on Iran, including ones aimed at the country's oil and financial sectors. EU leaders have pledged to try to keep Iran's oil trade and investment flowing, but noted that it would not be easy. However, Iran's foreign minister doesn't seem to be satisfied with their efforts, saying European political support for the accord was, quote, not sufficient. Mohammed Zavad Zarif made the comments on Sunday during a meeting with the EU's energy chief, Miguel Arias Canete, in Tehran. He added the possible withdrawal by major European companies from their cooperation with Iran is not consistent with the EU's commitment to implementing the nuclear deal. Several European firms suggested last week that their business in Iran would be restricted or end completely due to the reimposition of U.S. sanctions. Zarif went on to say the bloc should take more practical steps and increase its investments in Iran as well as preserve oil trade. Kennedy responded by pledging to preserve the nuclear pact and continue cooperation between the EU and Iran. He added that the 2015 deal was working to curb Iran's nuclear weapons ambitions. U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, meanwhile, is scheduled to unveil the Trump administration's plan on a new deal with Iran on Monday, which may include a proposal for fresh talks. President Trump has long accused Tehran of not keeping its end of the current deal and that it should be expanded to include Iran's ballistic missile program. Iran has insisted there is nothing to renegotiate. Nuaram Arirang News. This is a very special day for Korean youths in the final years or months or days of teenhood. Various events are held to mark their coming of age. Oh Seung helped us sample how this transition is traditionally celebrated here in the nation. The third Monday of May marks the transition from childhood to adulthood in Korea, and youth who are 20 in Korean age celebrate their coming of age. Around 610,000 South Koreans born in 1999 are celebrating adulthood on Monday. Here at Namsan Hanok Folk Village, 100 boys and girls are starting the next chapter of their lives as men and women. The coming of age ceremony dates back to the early 10th century during the Korea dynasty. As the tradition goes, the women have their hair tied into a bun and secured with a pinyo, a Korean traditional hairpin. The men have their hair tied in a top knot and put on a hat woven from horse hair called a khat. After a change of dress, the new adults take part in a tea and snack ceremony before they bow to the parents and elders. This ritual bowing and wearing traditional clothes, it instills pride in the country, a sense of courteousness, and helps youths gather their thoughts as they enter adulthood. Reaching the age of maturity comes with a sense of responsibility. In Korea, 19 is the legal age to vote, marry, drive and drink. The young adults here pledge to live as dutiful citizens, not just of Korea, but of the international community. I didn't feel like I was 20 before the ceremony was held, but after learning how to bow and listening to lectures, I really feel like an adult. I feel the responsibility to do well and manage things on my own. I don't quite feel like an adult just yet, but as I am now, I think I should behave and think courteously and live responsibly. Now that I'm 20, I feel that I should have a different mindset from when I was a minor and should also live differently. The celebrations take place throughout the country with gifts of roses and perfume presented to those blossoming into adulthood. Oh Seung, Arirang News. A revised employment equality ordinance was passed at the cabinet meeting recently, meaning in accordance with the change, both male and female employees seeking fertility treatment, such as artificial insemination or external fertilization, can take up to three days off work in one year, starting May 29th. The first off day is paid. The Ministry of Employment and Labor explained the move is designed to achieve two goals, helping couples suffering from fertility problems and also raising the nation's chronically low birth rates. For the first time in Korea, the government approved an artificial intelligence-based medical software. Some of the visible advantages of the newly approved device include the ability to instantaneously determine a person's bone age. Kan Young woo provides a glimpse of how they may reshape our future. When people hear the word medical, an image of a doctor, a nurse, or a hospital usually comes to mind. However, artificial intelligence-based medical technology is a different story. 
South Korea's Ministry of Food and Drug Safety has recently approved an AI-based medical software from the local firm Vuno, the first time such a program has been certified by the country's drug safety watchdog. This AI-powered device identifies the age of a person's bones by comparing their x-ray with a similar bone image representing a certain age. And patients don't have to wait for the results. It is called VunoMed Bone Age, and it cuts down the time needed for bone age assessment by 60%. Traditionally, doctors would have to pull out a reference book to determine the age of a person's bones, a process that usually took five minutes or longer. Um, so since we've increased accuracy by over 4 to 5 percent, we're dramatically reducing physician workflow. Um, it is designed for use at growth and development clinics for children to predict how much a child can potentially grow. It can also recommend a treatment plan for any growth hormone deficiencies. The local startup isn't done yet. Vuno is working to get approval for other AI-run image analysis software. Um, so we have product in the chest area for chest CT and chest um, x-rays and then we also have a fundoscopy pro uh, product um, that's similar to Google's product that we can automatically detect within the eye different um, pathologies like diabetic retinopathy. With its bone age analyzing AI program ready to be introduced, Vuno is looking to get the rest of their technology authorized and onto the local market as soon as possible. Kan Young-woo, Arirang News. K-pop group BTS has named it top social artist for the second year in a row at the Billboard Music Awards. They beat global household names like Justin Bieber, Ariana Grande, Demi Lovato and Shawn Mendes for the back-to-back -back feat. This marks the first time South Korean artists backed a Billboard Music Award twice. BTS was also the only artist from Seoul participating at this year's event. The Voice performed their latest number, Fake Love, on stage for the first time at the award ceremony. Meanwhile, they reached another milestone with the music video for the song Blood, Sweat and Tears. The band becomes the only South Korean group to have four music videos with 300 million views. Turning to the world of sports now, South Korea's volleyball superstar Kim Young-kyung is heading back to Turkey to get ready for a new season there. After playing a year for Shanghai, the 2012 London Olympic MVP signed a two-year contract with Turkish team Exa Sibasi, according to her agency, Inspo Korea, she turned down a more generous offer from China. Reason? According to Kim, the Turkish league is more competitive and she wants to sharpen her skills by taking on all comers. Kim Young-kyung is no stranger to that league as she played there for six seasons with Penerbahce. Time to turn to Michelle back at the Weather Center for the updates you need. Michelle, the pleasant weather continued, but I heard it's going to be a rainy one tomorrow. That's right, Daniel. It would have been better if we had a nice sunny day tomorrow since it's Buddha's birthday, a national holiday in Korea. So if you were planning to spend the day outdoors tomorrow, get it done in the morning because by the afternoon, the whole country will see some wet conditions. The amount of rain won't be much like what we saw last week. It'll be mostly between 5 and 40 millimeters until Wednesday morning. Taking a look at our readings in the morning, so we'll start off the morning with 16 degrees Celsius with Daegu and Gyeongju being a few notches cooler at 12 and 11 degrees respectively. The highs over in Seoul will top out to 24 degrees, Gwangju a tad warmer at 25 and Busan lower at 21 degrees. After the rain, sunny weather will return to the country all throughout the week with the mercury rising even higher. I'll leave you with the weather conditions around the world. That's all we could pack into our newscast at this hour. Thank you for watching wherever you may be tuning in from. Good day or good night.